Hello and welcome to the latest in Corporate Research Forum series of webinars. Today we're in the studio talking about responsible business and how can HR drive the agenda. I'm delighted to be joined in the studio by four guests, um, Catherine Dalton from Inter Intercontinental Hotel Group, and, and Catherine has a global responsibility for corporate responsibility. Sienna um, is joining us from Penguin Random House, Head of Creative Responsibility. Professor David Grayson, um, Cranfield School of Management. Um, and last but not least, Dr. Carmen von Rohr, who's from the, our own team at Corporate Research Forum. And both David and Carmen have been working on the research um, that we've just published. And the purpose of this webinar is for us to really dive into the topic of responsible business and in particular HR's um, role in that. And I guess it, uh, it's timely given all the headlines as I was walking into the studio today in terms of what has happened with Thomas Cook. Um, very sadly for all of the 9,000 employees, but also all of the uh, customers who are currently out on, on that again, we have a, a large business in the headlines um, and questions being asked about, you know, bonuses and remuneration. So we may well jump into that um, as, as we get going. Um, for those of you who've not done the webinars before, um, we'll have a discussion here in the studio and we'd love you to listen along and to send us your questions. Um, so if you tag them with hashtag CR Forum on Twitter or put them into the discussion feed, they'll get pushed through to me and I can make sure that um, I can ask those here in the, in the studio. Um, we also like your participation in terms of polls. We've done some research as part of this work and we're always interested to know what you, the audience, think in relation to um, these topics. And um, so what we want to do, given you know, that this is in the news, and I'll ask Carmen to share with us what's come out of the research in a minute, but what is driving your organisation's interest in this topic of responsible business? Um, just while we're having a conversation here, if you can be filling in that poll, that would be great. So Carmen, what did the research tell us? Um, why has this suddenly popped back up on everybody's agenda? Uh, yes, well, maybe I should start by giving a little bit of a definition because you see there's, there are a lot of different um, words that are used, whether it's triple bottom line or the old corporate social responsibility or sustainability. So I just want to clarify that we chose to use responsible business as sort of an umbrella term to capture okay. all of these different approaches. Um, so we're looking at what the business that a, a the responsibility that a business voluntarily takes for its social, economic, and environmental impacts. And looking at why everybody's suddenly interested again, um, because this is cyclical. Yeah, you it's know, not like it's new. In the 60s and 90s, it's not brand new. Um, but I think, you know, at a general level, we identified four factors. So globalization and economic liberalization. Obviously, we've had a lot of, a lot of economies have liberalized over the last couple of decades. Globalization has increased. There's been untold wealth from that, but it hasn't been evenly distributed. And so people are increasingly discontent and asking questions. Um, at the same time, technology has expanded exponentially. There are new and powerful tools that people can use. Activists, customers can make themselves mm, known mm. Uh, on social media so very quickly. The they UN can bring yesterday. pressure. Yeah. And, um, and of course, climate change. Um, many businesses are having to consider their impacts for their own future business performance as mm. well as the health of the planet. So at a general level, we see those factors driving it. But then when you drive down to the level of the organization, it's actually much more complicated. Um, and so we identified, uh, we sort of, there are so many factors that can drive a particular business and even different parts of a business or different leaders within the business. And so we loosely group them as defensive, strategic, or altruistic. So okay. defensive factors might be responding to activists or you know, addressing a product or service failure. Strategic might be enhancing your employer brand or responding to a social problem with a new product. Um, and altruistic is just, you know, it's the right thing to do. Okay, so Sienna, for you in the publishing um, mm. business, when you listen to what Carmen said about what the research found, why has this become important now for your business? Yeah, I think a lot of it rings true. I mean, we, um, I guess, started on this journey, to use a very over overused <laughs> phrase, um, about four and a half years ago. So I came into a new role that was actually created by our CEO. And I think part okay. of the main driver from, from him to create that role was um, that we were a newly merged company. So the two publishing houses of Penguin and Random House came together. This was a way in his eyes to kind of bring people together as one and to create something positive that was altruistic and was genuinely doing the right thing. But So it came out of the strategic 
absolutely. piece in terms of the merger and wanting to have one identity. Yeah, yeah. and I think that that stays true today and our um, approach has evolved over time for sure. So I think one of the things we were really keen to do from the get go, but has I think in, in recent years become increasingly more important to us is sort of move slightly away from the traditional CR which I think has been very typically sort of fundraising volunteering and that has a place but actually moving much more towards well actually how do we operate as a business how do we put mm. CR at the heart or responsible business at the heart of the decisions that we make every day um, and that was also behind the reason of us sort of creating this badge of creative responsibility and um, because there was a real allergy I think within the creative industries to the idea of anything being corporate and also a sort of sense that CSR or corporate responsibility was, you know, running a bake sale. So we wanted to create something <laughs> that had a, a different identity and, and sort of played up our creative roots. Um, but I think for us, the kind of main drivers, I would say, to both starting on this um, journey, but also evolving has been definitely employer brand. So that idea of kind of a reason to join and a reason to stay. And I think for us in particular, looking at all of the stats around kind of Gen Z and millennials has been really mm. interesting. So because publishing mm. has changed quite fundamentally as a business, hasn't it? And it attracting has. new people into what might seem a stuffy business historically. Totally. And I think, um, you know, our business is something like 75 percent under 30. So we're a really wow. youthful workforce. Um, and so we know more and more that people wanting to join, but also our current workforce really mm. care genuinely about this stuff. So I think that has been a major driver. But also for us, you know, it, it gives us a bit of a USP when we're pitching to authors. So it's not quite the same as the sort of investor relations piece. But, you know, what we do as a publisher is, um, you know, we try and buy authors off other publisher rivals. And so if we can say, look, this is what we're doing um, in the social purpose space, or this is what we're doing to make our you know, industry more inclusive and more representative, that is also a real reason and increasingly becoming a reason why authors are choosing us over others. Oh, okay, so that's interesting. So, so it's picking up on the point you were saying about, about different stakeholders. Mm, so it's both exactly. employees, but also... Um, external ones too. And I think authors. consumers, and I think for us, we are more and more putting social purpose and creative responsibility at the heart of our consumer brand. So for example, one programme that we have um, is called Penguin Talks, and we essentially take some of our biggest authors into secondary schools, we um, put that content um, onto YouTube for free and we create kind of teaching resources alongside it. And it's focused on sort of how do we help young people understand the world around them. Um, mm -hmm. And we've taken the likes of, you know, Michelle Obama into a secondary school and um, some really kind of um, big names. And for us, that is building that brand equity and introducing our brand to young people as well as giving something back. So it's a good sweet spot, I think. Well, the good thing is if you improve their literary skills, they're more likely to buy books or well, read, exactly, aren't they? Well, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but the hard thing with that, and we'll probably sort of go on to challenges later, but you know how you embed that long-term thinking in your organisation, I think, is so fundamental because yeah, we'll pick that up. you're not going to instantly get a return in the way that you might do with a marketing campaign. Okay, or well, we'll certainly else. pick up on the challenges sure later in this conversation. But I'm just, just, just interested, Catherine, being a global organisation mm. as, as IHGR, yep. and you're operating in, in many countries around the world, and so it's all very well sort of in a Western so-called yep. democracy um, that uh, you know we're talking about this but what's your experience sort of trying to embed something like this in countries that maybe have a different attitude towards this topic? Yeah I, I mean I think it's interesting because I mean if we think about so we operate in 100 countries around the world um, and as you say it varies that the, the messaging I would say varies um, but we think about sort of our key stakeholders, we think about the guests of the people staying in our hotels, we think about our colleagues who are actually really, really important in terms of actually delivering the experience and also the owners. So we don't we don't own the hotels, we predominantly franchise and manage. So, so actually, you're one step removed as absolutely. well in terms of your ability to influence. So it's it's so we you know, we can't just sort of say, right, you must do this because we want you to, because they'll be like, well actually, why should we just help you achieve your corporate goals? It's mm. all about the business case. And you are, you know, and actually it's interesting because we are seeing, um, you know, government around the world is at very different stages in terms, when we think about, I mean, environmental sustainability is, is sort of one of the, one of the key ones. Um, and we look and just trying to keep track of who is doing what and what regulations are coming out of where. Actually, we just need to take a stand as an organisation right, okay. and yeah. say, you know what, we know this is so important. So you have to, set, in a you way, demonstrate lead, you, you have yeah. to set tone, and you're you're stepping up and saying we're going to lead on this, absolutely, and 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 give the signal to your franchise. Yes. And others and others will follow. It's about influencing 
within the industry. I mean, we, we took a move a, a couple of months ago to, to ban the little plastic bottles in hotel rooms, you know, the oh, little okay. shampoo. Yes, and we, said, we are going to go to bulk amenities globally. Uh, and the, the, the reaction it got amongst our colleagues, um, amongst our guests, was overwhelmingly positive. Okay. And now our competitors are start, starting to follow suit. So being able to stop, you know, really kickstart a change is, is fantastic. And would you say that the environmental thing is the primary driver? I mean, just picking up on some of the trends that Carmen was mentioning, within your sector, is that, does that tend to be the, the lead? I, I, I think it's quite visible because mm. we are obviously so consumer facing. There's a lot of, you know, certainly from a waste perspective, waste yeah. seems yeah. to capture the imagination. You know, car, carbon does seems to be this slightly, um, it's more difficult for people to form an emotional attachment to carbon. It's extremely important. Yeah. Um, but I think the, the overarching, when we think about colleagues, the overarching purpose piece is really, really important. You were talking about, you know, we have a lot of young people in our workforce and have them being able to sort of think about they're contributing to some greater good. I mean, we talk a lot about our communities that we operate in, sort of really bringing that to life is important. Mm, okay. Well, I'm noticing that the audience haven't quite woken up yet because we've only had four of them respond to our poll. Um, but the four of them that have responded to our poll have said it's because it's the right thing to do. So, David, I'm curious from your point of view and your research, um, it's all very well saying it's the right thing to do. But in practice, you know, actually making things happen on the ground. I mean, we've heard a couple of great examples here, but particularly... HR and the HR function. Um, what's your experience of, of what drives them to step up and, and take this more seriously and, and, and contribute? Well, I think from a, a, a business perspective, it, it's not an either or, that either it's the right thing to do or it's a, because we can make a business case for this. It seems to me that, that, that the, 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 the intelligent businesses now are actually looking for the sweet spot, spot where they find both. Right. And actually, some of those things will be very obvious. So the, the, I remember going back to the early 1990s when the International Hotels and Tourism Environmental Initiative first came up with the idea that you shouldn't have to wash the towels in people's... Or um, sheets every or day. Or sheets <laughs> every day and so on. And, and that was you know, just just a win-win. A Mm -hmm. um, because it saved the organisation's money, but actually also it, it was saving you know, some energy and, 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 and so on. So uh, I think all parts of a, of, of a business really need to get more skilled at looking to see, so what do our different stakeholders expect of us, whether it's those Penguin authors who are now switching to write for Penguin because, amongst other things, they think that actually this is a, a company which has really got some clear positive values and things, or whether it's the, 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 the hotel guests who are saying, actually, um, th 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 this makes me a bit more loyal to, to, to that particular hotel chain. Mm. And I think when it, when it comes to the HR professionals, it is thinking, amongst other things, about, so what's the kind of data that we can help our management colleagues with that helps them to make the business case up through the organisation. Oh, okay. So you know, when, when, when um, um, uh, Sienna is talking about the fact that you can show in um, Penguin Random House that employees are more motivated because the company is is is, is actually making the, the, these positive steps, that's presumably because HR has been playing its part in helping to get the data together. And that's giving you a competitive advantage then in the marketplace, Sienna? Yeah, I think it is. And it's, it's, it's often very hard to quantify, I think, is the only watch that I would have. And I think there is something here about authenticity and relevance, which is really important Absolutely. because I think it can often be really overwhelming, I think, especially if you're just starting out in responsible business, that there are so many different issues that you have to address. And I can't even imagine when you're looking at that in a global place, let alone in the UK. But I think there is something about how do you make sure that you're tackling the issues which are most relevant and authentic to you. So I think that that is where people can often get it a little bit wrong. So I don't know if you remember, um, I think it was last year, Lush did a campaign that was quite anti-police and it was sort of about police racism. Mm. And, you know, normally Lush 
I think, get things bang on the money in terms of what they do and they you know, do amazing things in terms of ethical sourcing, etc. But it was just a little bit outside of their kind of wheelhouse, really. And I think it landed wrong as a result. Um, There's always, yeah, and that's the challenge. There's a big mm. debate at the moment around how active, how much of an activist a CEO or a senior exactly. leadership team should mm -hmm. be. And I think that mm -hmm. that was a good example of one where some of their audience, some of their stokeholders felt they'd crossed the line exactly. in terms of that wasn't relevant to their brand. Why were they speaking out and, about and that? I think therefore, it, th 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 absolutely right on that. And it's a salutary lesson. And I think what the public gets confused by, and rightly so, is I don't see any connection at all between what this company is now publicly advocating for mm -hmm. and, and, and what this company does. Exactly. So I think it's, it's important. Police and it's basketball. important for yeah. businesses. <laughs> it's not it's authentic. Important, but it's mm. Exactly. Mm. It's not authentic. But where is the locus? Mm. Um, so I think that, that, that a, that a business leader, I personally think, and we've got loads of evidence from things like the Edelman Trust Barometer and uh, over the years and so on, that now increasingly employees expect their CEOs and their leadership to be speaking out on issues of social justice and sustainable development. But you have to be able to make the connection yeah. for employees, but also for customers and wider society, why this company has a locus in, in, on, mm. on this particular issue. Absolutely. And I want to pick up with you, Catherine, because I know you've got the background in investor relations. Have, and, yes. and this is something for me that we can be doing all these nice things out in the world for all mm -hmm. these other stakeholders. Yep. But actually, if our investors aren't willing to back us on yep. something like this, that can be challenging. Um, and, you know, so I'm just curious, you know, so having come from in that background, that's a pretty important stakeholder. Yeah. Are you seeing any changes in that community? I, I would say so. So I worked in investor relations for 10 years um, at IHG, um, moved over to CR coming up to a year ago. And it was really interesting because all my years in investor relations, sort of the, the sustainability, corporate responsibility, ESG questions were very much sort of your specialist analysts asking my team or me. They would not bother the CEO or CFO oh, with such questions. However, roll on the last year and we have had um, a question from an analyst about plastic on the actual res full year results conference call. You've had our CFO being asked in mainstream investor meetings about sustainability. So I would say it has just shocked up the agenda. Mm -hmm. I think there is still some way to go. You will have certain investors who obviously care more about it, but I think it's not just kind of a screening, mm. these particular companies are out because they don't meet my baseline into mm. actually people are genuinely becoming more interested yeah. in these items. And I know at our event um, last week we had a colleague from Unilever was coming to talk to us and I remember Paul Polman when he became chief executive actually spoke straight to the investment community and said yeah this is where I'm taking this company. If you're not in it for the long term, yeah. we're not the stock to hold. And yeah. that was quite a courageous thing because he had to mm. believe that enough other investors were willing to come in and who were yeah. in it for a long time. And it's, you yeah. know, but that, that being, having the courage to be that, that brave when and you're looking for capital in the markets. Yeah, and we've started actually, you know, in, in, in when I was in investor relations, we would never put, well, we, we, we did occasionally put the odd slide on, on sustainability within the main results presentation, but then, you know, the feedback was, that well, nobody's really that interested. <laughs> Whereas now, they've put it back in. I'm like, this is amazing. You know, I'm being asked for content for our mainstream investor presentation. Yeah. So it's definitely changed. And it's coming from so many different sources now, you see. I mean, Mark Carney, the, the retiring mm -hmm. governor of the Bank of England, has been chairing a global task force looking yeah. at how does the financial sector get a grip on what are the systemic risks mm. of climate change mm. to the financial system. And I was talking to a, a, a big global investor recently who said, and just as we need to think about the systemic risks to the financial sector from climate change, we need to do the same thing in terms of what are the systemic risks to the financial system from hyper-global inequalities. His yeah. words, mm. not mine. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. And your point, I think, earlier, Carmen, about one of the themes was globalisation mm -hmm. um, that came up. and so picking up on the point that David just made, what else came through in the research sort of outside of the climate agenda that were really, um, you know, companies, so the globalisation, you know, what, what else were you seeing in some of the research? 
You mean as in what, what people are focusing on? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I would say climate change and social inequality are the two big things because they, they have the greatest potential to really cause a lot of social problems. Um, but people are concerned about how people are being treated in the supply chain, human rights, um, the okay. local communities. For example, if your industry is mining, for example, and there's a lot of controversy around that. And uh, we saw what happened with um, in Brumadinho mm -hmm. um, earlier this year. Um, so, it, but it is, it is really sector specific. What, what your what your concerns are, um, and that's but it goes back to Sienna's point, if if I may, about the importance for each business to understand. So, what are our most material impacts? Mm -hmm. Social, environmental, economic, yes, both negative and positive, and what are the things which our stakeholders can are concerned most about, and we start then to marry that, and that should give you a materiality matrix, which tells you look, these are the really important things. To concentrate on, yeah, and that you can do whether you are a global business like um, Catherine and Sienna are representing, or indeed whether you're a very small local business, mm. you still have those those impacts. Obviously, the whole process is much simpler for mm. for, for a, a small North Norfolk um, kind of uh, cafeteria or something. But um, although it, that it's tends to be similar te techniques, yes, well, except uh, we were talking about that recently. We were talking about rural communities and business in rural communities as opposed to urban communities, mm. and often the rural communities um, experience the the pressures more quickly, and, and you know they're at the front front they're edge of some of these things. The they're embedded in, in the community. Mm. I'm I'm curious. Um, I'm interested. If any of you on the um, in the audience out there have got any questions for us, then please do pop them in, um, and uh, I can put them through to our panel. But I'm just wondering, in terms of sort of internally within your organisations, are there any sort of groups of employees that are are more difficult to reach? Because I'm I'm conscious that some of you, you know, in terms of you've talked about your franchise model, but mm -hmm. um, so in, in you know, you'll have start, you know, so not your authors, but people who perhaps um, are in warehouses or out delivering things like that. Mm -hmm. What challenges have you found in trying to drive this agenda forward? Yeah, I suppose it's as with any internal comms challenge, you have different employee populations and some are slightly easier to communicate with than others. So we have a um, nearly half our workforce in our distribution. Yep. So that's in warehouses um, out in Essex. And so it's a very different workplace. So it's not as easy to have digital communication, for example. And actually what we have found is that different things resonate with them. So we really amplify our local community agenda in those employee populations. So we really talk much more about the work we're doing in local schools, for example, in those areas local to those warehouses and dial down um, a lot of the work that we're doing, for example, to um, reach out and publish new diverse voices because that is just not as interesting or doesn't seem to as resonate as much. Whereas obviously in London with people that are having much more office-based jobs, um, they are much more interested in things like what we're doing on inclusion or the um, project I mentioned before where we're taking authors into secondary schools and I think part of what we've learned over time is is working out when and where to dial bits up and when to dial bits down and also to think more about how we can really simplify our messaging because I think um, we have still got work to do to, to, to really hone in on our um, the way that we talk about this because mm, I think mm. to people who are yeah, busy, you know, point, you need, it, you know what is this line. thing? What yeah. is it all about? Yeah. Mm, mm. So I think it's it's about different messaging and and talking about slightly different things as I, well. I think that's really important, and we we certainly see that across our business. You know, you will have, especially when you're talking about something like trying to reduce the amount of energy, for example, that a hotel is using. In some places, you can appeal to um, uh, people's sense of wanting to do the right thing for the planet. In others, it's about, well, actually, reduce your energy consumption, reduce your cost. Yes. So it's actually yeah. how do you tailor that message to make sure that it's actually landing and resonating in the right way with those stakeholder groups? So, so what I'm hearing is one of the evolutions of this area of work is a much tighter segmentation or clarification of who wants what messages and it's not a one size fits all um, and you've got to be yeah. internally much more in touch with that's what I'm also hearing you've got to be yeah. much more in touch with the external environment so if you're internally focused yeah. you're at risk of missing the nuances in terms of who needs communicating a absolutely I think a, a, a large part of of what I do and what I'm trying to do now in this new role is being 
very embedded within the operations. Right. Okay. So you can't sit, I think, in, in your class, ivory tower in exactly, corporate. Exactly. <laughs> there's like, you know, here's these people in corporate telling us what to do to be a responsible business when actually it's, you know, it's, it's down to the hotels to actually own this. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's, that's really important as well. This kind of getting the outside in mm. messages and, and, and ideas and, 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 and insights as, as well as the, the inside out. And it, if we're thinking about, so what does all this mean for the, 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 the busy human resources professional? I mean, one of the key sets of, 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 of questions it, it raises, for me at least, is what therefore do we need to change and add into our people development programs, our learning and development suite of courses and things? What do we want to be putting into our leadership programs right. at different levels of, of, of sort of young high flyers through to sort of about to be sort of the very top leadership team, CADA and, 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 and so on. And what should we be specifying in if we're buying in, let's say, management education from external business school providers, et cetera, et cetera. So there's some really important opportunities for our HR professional colleagues okay. to be asking themselves about what do we, will we need to do differently? And that, that leads me on to something that is a perennial here at Corporate Research Forum, which is evidence. And, and what is the evidence for this? And I know that historically in some of the other areas we've looked at, you know, we've sort of lacked evidence, Carmen. And I'm wondering, was this area any better? Is, <laughs> is that where we need to be paying attention um, to? What is the evidence base? Well, yes, yeah, certainly. If you look at the business case for responsibility, it is quite robust. And, and David and I took a very deep dive into it. There is a lot out there. So you can sort of break it down into for customers, right, who create your market by buying your ethical products and services or boycotting them. Um, investors who obviously invest or withhold investment and employees and employees are believed to um, drive the case in several ways so organizations who have strong employer brands or, or have employer brands with a, a strong ethical component are believed to be better able to attract and retain those high-quality employees and those employees go on to be more motivated more committed um, more innovative it's it's win-win and there's plenty of evidence that that is actually True, the case So is the evidence so. is out there, so we need to make sure that HR is accessing that yes. in order, as David was saying earlier, to influence within, within the business. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, before we move on to the next thing, I just want to um, ask our audience again. I mean, we've started to touch on a few of the challenges of, of really um, embedding this within our organisations. And so I just those of you um, listening in, you know, what is the biggest challenge for you in your organisation to develop and in implementing a responsible business strategy? So if you um, uh, be answering that while we continue to, to talk in here. I mean, the Thomas Cook story has sort of brought this back into the news, the extent to which we talk a good talk, but we're not walking the talk. And David, I think it was you earlier uh, mentioned the importance of and I think you as well said about the CEO being brought in and leadership being brought in. Um, you know, what for you are the signs that actually your leadership are shifting? I mean, you've said obviously your CEO's led it, but but what are you what are you seeing as some of the challenges and 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 also where you're getting some breakthroughs? I mean, mm. I think the audience would like to know how do they shift some of their leadership? <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's hard. I mean, yeah. one of the, we we're very lucky because he was sort of brought in from the beginning, but I think what we tried to do from um, the get-go was to actively engage other members of the leadership team or our board equivalent because I think it's a really easy thing for people to think is being done over there, being dealt with by CR and HR and sort of... The risk, It's all yeah. very lovely and They're great. They're doing it. They're yeah. doing it. They're getting on with it. I don't need to worry about it. So I think you really need to make it their problem. Um, and we created a, a kind of um, governance structure which meant that we had different members of the leadership team involved um, actively in the decision making process and really aware of what was happening. So um, essentially choosing where the investment went. So it, they they were having some say in terms of the direct strategic exactly. direction. In terms of okay. So it wasn't felt like it was just a CEO top down thing and it yep. wasn't felt like it was a siloed CR or HR thing. But I do think there is also something about um, that's not easy to do overnight. So how do you start to build something and go where the energy is? I'm a great believer in that. You know, how do you find one topic or one leader that is really brought in and you build something that is successful and then everyone sort of wants a piece of it? Yeah. Um, so I think we also so did a bit of that. <laughs> their competitive instincts kick yeah, in. Yeah, why you know, What they're doing over there that's exactly. really good, I want some of that. Yeah. Exactly. I think it's hard to say 
you know, go from naught to 100 and say, right, this is now part of your KPIs and this is, you know, that's gold standard and we're not quite there yet okay. ourselves. But I think starting where the energy is and finding ways to have active involvement is really key. Okay. And Catherine, I mean, given, you know, the diversity of your organisation, yeah. what are some of the sort of micro shifts or behaviours that you've seen have helped businesses yeah. move? I mean, sort of obviously tone from the top is really important and we've had a, we have a, 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 a CR board committee, sub, subcommittee of the board, and that's been in place for a while. Right. I would say that the, the, the more recent change that certainly I've seen since coming into my role, I mean, I'm, I'm doing a piece of work at the moment looking at what it means to be a responsible business, you know, 10 year view. And we've had, I've had time on our executive committee agenda three times this year, mm. really engaging conversation with the leaders of the business. And in addition, we've set up what sounds similar to your governance committee, where, so responsible business for us, I mean, I lead on the environment and, and the community investment side, but then we have sort of the, the, the legal risk side, we have the HR side, we have cybersecurity and all those pieces together, it's a recognition that actually there's no one team that leads on responsible business. So it's really it's embedding bringing it. everybody together, plus people from the operations, each of the regions, to have that conversation about how do we approach being a responsible business? What trade-offs are there? Because actually, yeah, you know, yeah, you, you yeah. could spend all your time, but actually if we want our hotels to do one or two things that really make a mm. difference, how do we phase all of these different things? So I would say starting to have that formal conversation. I mean, all these teams work together closely anyway to think about how do we approach this agenda in a very planned, strategic way has, has been a big change over the last year. And I, I suppose that's because all organisations have habits and rituals, be that yep. business planning or strategy processes. And so what I'm hearing is really starting to bring this front and centre. Yeah, and think long the, term. Yeah, okay. You know, because most companies, and this is really front and centre of what I used to do in investor relations, you think maybe, you know, you tend to think in the year for the year, you might think about the next year, and then you might think about two years out. But, you know, this 10-year view is really quite a different way okay. for most companies to be thinking, but they have to. I mean, you were talking about this, the, the, the TCFD um, being led by Mark Carney in terms of thinking about the impact of, of climate change on, on the long term, your long term operations. So I think that's a really interesting shift in terms of management mindset. But it's also interesting. I'll, I'll come to you in a second, David. The cultural difference, because I remember having a discussion with a CRF member um, Bev, who, who works for a Japanese organisation. Mm. And when she first went in there, their strategic timeline starts at 50 years. Mm. Really? And yeah. so they work from 50 years mm. back. And that, you know, and, and that contrast of yep. most Western organisations, we start at this quarter. <laughs> yeah. And as you yeah, say, we've yeah. gone out to 10 years. But actually, yeah. if you start with the 50 year well, yes. timeline, and then that, you, you start yeah. to ask some very different questions. Sorry, David, you wanted to come so in. So I, 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 was, I was just itching to come in because Catherine used some really important words a few moments ago. She talked about strategic and she talked about long term. Mm. And I think it's great that a, a business like Intercontinental are thinking about, so not just today, what does it look like to be a responsible business, but in 2030. And I'm yeah. certainly seeing more businesses actually that, asking that kind of question. And in order to do that, you have to understand what are some of these external forces that forget all the language about responsible business or sustainability or corporate responsibility, et cetera. Just think about what is going to be the marketplace, what's going to be the regulatory mm. environment, mm. what's the labor market going to be like in a 10-year horizon, and actually in all of those different areas, there are some really big questions and, and forces that we would actually call, call sustainable development. Yes. And then yeah. I think linking back as well, if you think actually, you know, getting a management team to, 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 to think long term when actually what, it, what, is the, <laughs> what is the average um, tenure of, 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 of a CEO? So it's actually then thinking about how do you then link that back to remuneration um, and actually incentivize people to have that longer term view? incentivize them for the right things. I mean, I noticed some of the paper headlines as I was coming in this morning questioning whether the incentive schemes for Thomas Cook senior people were 
directed in the right direction. No doubt that will yep. get looked at um, in due course. Interesting um, response to the um, poll. Um, so half of the, the folks who've completed this have said that for them, integrating a responsibility mindset into the organisational culture is, is the biggest challenge, but obviously also the critical. So what you're talking about, both, you know, all of you, is that um, uh, that's what you've been trying to do, um, followed by about a quarter of respondents narrowing the gap between our intentions and our actions. Mm -hmm. So that, that walking the talk, and I know we've got lots of examples out in the corporate world where um, people haven't walked the talk, but, but Carmen, I'm curious, from the research, I mean, have we got some other, I mean, we've got some great examples here in the room, any other examples of where organisations have managed to walk the talk, if even in sort of small, small um, examples that you heard at the conference last week? Um, I think um, Tom's Shoes is a, a good example of that. I don't know if you're familiar with Tom's yeah. Shoes, but they have a, a buy one, give one model where you buy a pair of their shoes and they give to a child in need. Um, and they've done a lot of interesting things. Uh, you know, a lot of other companies started to copy that business model, and so then they mm. had to think about, well, what do we do? We're professionalizing. Do we um, do we ditch it? And instead, they decided to go in the direction of evolving it further and looking at how they can be even more involved in their communities. And they had um, they had a really interesting going back to David's point about learning and development. They they had a sort of hackathon where they brought people at different levels and from different functions across the business to think about how do we evolve our giving model. Um, and they also do some great things for for their employees. Um, around letting them do projects where they give back to the community. So I saw that as a company that was really walking the talk. So but that, in a sense, comes us back to, so they started with a particular business Absolutely. model in mind. Absolutely, yes. They had a visionary CEO. Okay, who... and what's happening there is others are copying that business model. So mm -hmm. it's so one challenge is if you're a startup, you can, you can kind of put this in your DNA to start with. The challenge is if you're an existing business that in a sense that's grown up in the Western capitalist model, how do you pivot from that mm -hmm. to a, a more sort of responsible um, uh, shift? Some say so some of the examples. So what I'm, I think I'm hearing is so leadership and governance and, and embedding it in the existing processes starts yeah. to shift the dial. And, you know, I, I, I think back to that authenticity point is so important because it never fails to amaze me and excite me when I actually go to one of our hotels. They're an individual little business, often doing all of these things anyway. Yes, and because they're embedded in their community. Because it's so important to be able to, 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 to be doing these things for the community. So actually, how do you then do that across 5,700 hotels. Right. <laughs> um, so I think actually it's just listening to what our people are telling us anyway and what they're doing and as you say, trying to scale that. Catherine, mm -hmm. can I just ask, do you actually in your kind of intercontinental, presumably you have an, uh, an intranet um, yeah. where good practice is, is shared and so on, do you actually have a part of the intranet where employees in the different hotels around the world can actually share the, their insights about the kind of practical things they're doing around, say, local sourcing for, for food or around being really proactive in recruiting yeah. new staff from, from marginalised communities in that yeah. area or whatever it may be so that others yeah. can learn faster? Do you know what we don't today? And actually, that is one of the big challenges is, um, and we need something like that because, you know, I every day almost I hear about a hotel somewhere doing something amazing. And it's like, how could we not know about that? So mm. I think that is one of the challenges of being so big is that you're, you know, finding a way to actually pull together all these good stories and share best practices is going to be really important. So that people can pinch from their colleagues. Yeah, totally. as exactly. As exactly. As Stealing with pride, as Tom <laughs> Peters says. Absolutely. And one of the ways yeah. that, that you can actually sometimes short circuit that is by having a kind of annual CEO competition yeah. or awards which helps to give you a lot of the the stories and the case studies. Because yeah. yeah. people can relate much more easily to a story about the Intercontinental Hotel in, I don't know, Dar es Salaam or in Singapore or what yeah. have you is doing this. Well, gosh, if they can do that there, then we can certainly do it yeah. better here with our hotel. Yeah. And is there a balance, Walter Strike, though, between how you kind of empower and celebrate what people are doing locally 
and making sure it doesn't become really scattergun because I think that's mm -hmm. often a real risk in this space that people chase the things that they either personally feel passionate about or what's the sort of flavour of the month. So, right, you know, shiny HR things. Exactly. I remember studying that a while ago. <laughs> and it's the same, I think, in this, but... but I think it's creating something that is loose enough that you can still capture that really local, fantastic stuff and that doesn't feel like you're kind of shutting conversations down, but equally that you're just trying to make sure it doesn't feel like you're doing 25 different things. And I think that's where, just coming back to the point around how you embed in your culture, I think there is something about a clarity of message that is really important. So, I mean, I think a lot of brands at the moment are going through a piece of work to say, right, what is our purpose as an organisation and as a brand? And obviously that's a big kind of global theme and we're in the middle of it at the moment as Penguin. Um, but I think that really helps when you just have one clear thing that everyone is working towards, mm -hmm. um, which can be adapted, but that isn't really scattergun. Mm, okay, that's helpful because there is that tension, isn't there, between giving people the freedom to experiment mm. and innovate at a local level, but also then being able to capture the lessons learned from that so that you can replicate them if, if they're helpful. I'm conscious we're coming towards the end of, of our time together. And I know from previous webinars that um, audience have really valued um, hearing sort of very practical tips um, from, from those of you here in the studio. So if there was one thing, if we've got folks out there who are sort of starting out on this journey, or even if they're somewhere along it, what would be your sort of main lesson learned? If I come mm. to you first, Catherine, what would your top tip be? Yes, I mean, I, I think for me, it would be having a really good commercial understanding of the business. So I guess that that was the, the benefit for me coming from my IR background is that I really understood, I really understand our business model and what actually the rec so how I can make recommendations right. for how we can actually create value. So I'm not seen as sort of somebody who's just making these kind of fluffy suggestions sitting on the periphery. I can actually provide real value and insight. And picking up, on, I mean, at, at CRF, we've done research on commercial acumen for HR. So coming back to the theme of this is how does HR drive? So what I'm hearing for you, so if we're sitting out there as an HR colleague, we need to make sure we really yeah. understand the drivers of our business Absolutely. and that makes our ability yeah. to influence much more powerful. Completely. And anybody who joins my team from outside the industry, I'm like, right, you have to go and spend time in the hotels. Yeah. The first thing you have to do is go spend time with housekeeping, go spend time with engineering, because that is core to everything that we do. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Sienna? Yeah, I mean, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. And I think there is something about how you keep it as simple as possible and don't get overwhelmed by how many topics there are in this space. So I would say there is something about how do you pick the, the two or three things that are most relevant as we've, as we've talked about. And those are the things that you talk about again and again to your employees, to your customers, to your the wider world. And it doesn't mean that you can't be addressing some of those other topics, whether that's modern slavery or anything else in the background, but just that to, to, for things to resonate, that simplicity and you know, um, specificity is is really the way forward, so you, I think. You feel like you're shifting the dial on some things and you're not becoming overwhelmed by, my God, we can't exactly. save the planet. And here's a 70-page CR yeah. report with 20 <laughs> different indicators. And, you know, some businesses have to do that because of reporting, but yeah. I think there is something about keeping it simple. Okay, lovely. Thank you. David? So I think both Sienna and, and, and Catherine's points are really well made. Um, you obviously need to have a kind of a baseline mm -hmm. of at least decent performance because otherwise you get into <laughs> yes. what many of our listeners um, identified as a real problem, which is the, the intent versus the actual practice um, gap. Yep. And I, I don't think there are many organisations in, 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 in that gap situation who are doing that deliberately. No. Yeah, there are a few, but yeah. actually an increasing, a decreasing number. But I think it's, it, it, is, it is more just because, oh, gosh, didn't really think that our corporate tax strategy was part of being a responsible mm -hmm. business. Uh, rather, mm -hmm. didn't really think that the differential between our top executive pay and our lowest paid um, full-time equivalent was part of corporate responsibility. Afraid it is. Yeah. Um, so, so actually understanding so what's the the kind of the baseline that and we really need to issues. have and the breadth of issues. Mm. But then, absolutely, um, uh, uh, as Sienna is saying, what are the things that we really want to be known for which will resonate with our core stakeholders, employees mm. and customers and so on, 
And those are the things that we really then, that, 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 that then push on. But we, we do need at least a baseline. Um, thank you. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to call it to um, a close there. Just to say thank you so much for being in the studio with me. For those of you online, thank you for participating in the poll. Um, the discussion will continue online beyond us coming out of the studio live. Also, if you've got colleagues who haven't been able to join us live on this call, we will be posting um, this uh, conversation and uh, we hope you can listen to it on demand. And again, if you've got any questions that we've not been able to answer live on air, um, then we'll be happy to uh, respond to those offline. So thank you for joining us. And that concludes our webinar. Thank you to everybody in thank the room. Thank you. Thank you.